The following is a presentation of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. It's time to go on the mat. The Cedar Valley's longest running radio show devoted entirely to wrestling. Brought to you by Rolling Ford and the National Wrestling Hall of Fame Dan Gable Museum on 1650 The Fan. Welcome to On the Mat. I am Kyle Klingman of the National Wrestling Hall of Fame Dan Gable Museum. Joined by our own Where's Waldo, Doug Van Gelder. You're pretty easy to find. I see you. I everywhere. don't blend in the crowd real well. You're, well, <laughs> you know, I'd be easier to find in Waldo, most cases. Even with that gaudy hat. Yeah, where was it? I just I had another Doug sighting. They're just so fun and so kind of random and sporadic it's just it's so much fun when well i don't home. know if it was the last week i had my grandkids had grandma camp all week last week with my grandkids yeah so. well <laughs> it's it's not only fun personally for me with a doug sighting but it's when someone else gets to tell me about a doug sighting and you just see them glow or the just the voice inflection that they have i get to see at least once a week so I get somewhat of a fix. I'd like a little bit more than what I do, but what the heck? I'll take what I can get. Sure. And, I'm happy to give it anytime. Well, I know you are. Hey, and, Anything for you, Kyle. Hey, it's It's been such a, a crazy time to talk about different things. We've had the world team trials, and we've had the golf, and we're going into the pro wrestling weekend. We need to take a step back. I have two stories on here that I've wanted to talk about for about two months right now. Well. And we need to bring it. It has up. been hectic. It has been. You know, I, I felt the same way that we've been kind of shunning, shunning our responsibilities as broadcasters yeah. to get some of these stories out there. So, what studio have you had? Well, okay. So, first is it's Jim Miller's birthday today. It's July 5th. So, it's happy birthday to Jim Miller, iconic Waterloo legend, 10 time NCAA championship coach from Wartburg. Always want to celebrate him and his legacy. But this story comes from Jim Miller hearing it at the Iowa Wrestling Hall of Fame several weeks ago. And I relayed this story to you, and it has local significance since Joel Greenley, who is being inducted, is from Waverly, Iowa. And I think you probably know the story I'm going to tell you. It's when Jim Miller was out in Las Vegas. He was with Bruce Baumgartner and Joel Greenley, two super heavyweights. And they went to an all-you-can-eat buffet, and the manager told them, they said, we will give you your money back if you stop eating. How awesome is that, Doug? That's that's a page out of my own book. I know, and I knew you'd appreciate that. How amazing is that when you have a manager say, you've eaten so much, we will... We can't afford your, to keep you right, around. We'll give you your money back if you stop eating. How awesome is that? So... I'm probably giving you the shortened version. Jim Miller could give you the the real version because I wasn't there, so I'm rehashing a story. Sure, sure. But I I love that story, and I think it's just a quintessential wrestling story because you have two super heavyweights. They can eat. They don't have to worry about making weight. No. No, they don't. You're right. They are big boys. And it was so much fun, even though Joel wasn't at the Dan Gable Celebrity Golf Tournament, to have Justin there and have Justin Greenlee and Stephen Neal in the same house it was pretty cool it was very interesting to hear them two talk with each other about some of their shared experiences so it was it was it was good seeing justin and to see kyvin gadson and Stephen neal go on a boat ride at jerry rolling's house to do two loops what, what a, and then then stand there on the on the you know in the setting sun and just talking wrestling yeah for another half hour after the boat cruise so yeah, just i love those that. two alone on that boat with the with the I'd have loved to have been the pilot of the boat. Exactly. I know. And just a reminder, if you haven't caught our shows, Stephen Neal was two-time NCAA wrestling champion for Cal State Bakersfield, 1999 world champion in wrestling, who went on to a 10-year career with the New England Patriots, didn't play a down of college football. Kyvin Gadsden, the most recent NCAA champion from Waterloo, won the NCAA championships, 197 pounds in 2015, still competing, number two on the ladder at 213 pounds, so he's still doing well. But to see him pick his brain, understand that this is an icon in our sport, and utilizing him, and a lot of people were utilizing Stephen Neal while he was here. It just wasn't, Absolutely. It wasn't just a couple people. A lot of people wanted to pick his brain and just be near him and just 
feed off his vibe because he has a, a great experience not only as a champion individual athlete, but I think a lot of people wanted to know what was it like to be be coached by Bill Belichick. I think that was a very common theme, and you really picked up that Bill Belichick has a very systematic approach, and he has that Gable-esque quality about him. We, we dug into a little bit about why he didn't uh, play college football, and it was quite simply because nobody recruited him for it. Really? Yeah. He wasn't the biggest guy in high school. He kept getting bigger as he got out, and that's uh, consequently ended up being big enough and certainly rangy and athletic enough to play in the NFL. And he came out as a 189-pound senior in high school, yeah. placed fourth in the high school state tournament in California one time. I think that's part of the great story, too, is he never Absolutely. won state, never even got to the finals. And then you go on to be the best in the world in two sports. Which, I think which that's Peterson amazing. brother never won a state title? I want to say neither did. I know that neither did. I, okay, I, I think that's so. possible. I, I know that John Peterson was fifth in NAIA, and then I think his is probably our most incredible wrestling story, going from fifth in NAIA in 1970 to an Olympic gold medalist yeah. in 1976, and maybe one of the most dominating performances in the history of our sport. And then a silver medalist in 1972. So two years after getting fifth in NAIA, you're a silver medalist at the Olympics. And I think if you ask him about it, there's one word why that happened, and it's Gable. He just got him raised to another level, a higher level, and he'll tell you that, that he got him believing and got him in that system. And course, I think that's what Bill Belichick and John was. wasn't his teammate. Ben was, right? Correct. Ben was a two-time NCAA champion for Iowa State. Right. So you have that connection and you have that ability to, to grow in that, that capacity. Second story, we've got to make sure we sneak this in. It's almost hard to believe in today's landscape, but Chuck Yegla was telling me that when you won an NCAA championship, you get gifts. You get a ring or you get a watch. You get different gifts and the NCAA can regulate. And I think the university decides on what gifts you can choose from. Well, in 1979, the University of Iowa won the NCAA championships. I think it was their fourth title in five years. So they won in 75, 76, didn't win in 77, and then 78, 79. So fourth in five years. Their gifts, it wasn't a ring, it wasn't a watch, they gave them shotguns. <laughs> Could you imagine that today? Not at all. Giving shotgun, all. Giving a shotgun as your wow. reward for winning an NCAA championship. And this is real. This is not <laughs> something Fabria, they now, gave them shotguns. This is probably shotguns. something the NRA would like to hear about and, well, and, and, I, and make, it, make it an annual thing. It, I, we're a wrestling show. I'm not here to get into politics. I'm just saying that <laughs> blows me away. It is. If, yeah, literally blows. Just, <laughs> I mean, my gosh, to, to think about that happening, to, to know how far we've come from that, that, that just would be unheard of. That would be. Now, Chuck said this where? What's that? He wasn't setting you up, was he? I don't think so. Okay. Setting me up for okay. what? He just. He well, I don't know. No, I. I've ever maybe he was just telling tales. No, I don't think it's a tale. <laughs> okay, and, and we'll have to at some point get them on the show just to to verify. Well, that. There's, but, there's a number of people you could verify that with. Yeah, but I think Chuck still has that shotgun. So it's man, that that was really That's a real collector's item. Yeah, I'm sure. But if that was today, ESPN, USA Today, New York Times, that would be front page news. That would just be. That would be off the charts. I don't even think we would know how to handle that today. And it still seems funny, even back in 1979, that they would think that you could do that. But it's pretty pretty remarkable. So those are my two stories. The, yeah, the, the backstory on that would be interesting to hear. I, I think they wanted to get away from the traditional, hey, we gave you a ring, we gave you a watch. Yeah, they had everything they needed in those four, four years. Yeah, so... I think you win championships, and maybe it's old hat to just have a championship ring, and they wanted to do something different. So I'm assuming Two years that's later you might get a watch. And yeah, I mean, who knows? Now they come four out of five, and then nine nine consecutive, right? Yeah, they yeah went seven after what that. Did they give the year after? Yeah, <laughs> the shot I don't know. Well, you you got to get creative. The ammunition. So, yeah. So when when you win championships, you got to get creative. But I think ring is always a safe bet. And during that era, you had well, yeah, four or five of them. Seeing that Super Bowl ring that that uh, was shared, 
during the, the, the weekend that I think I said this the last time I put it on my thumb and it was still just rattling around. That's how big <laughs> Stephen Neal's hands are. Yeah. I mean, it was just, I don't know what that thing was, but I mean, it was diamond studded. Oh, it's kids were just a gog at looking at it, man. It was I fun bet. to watch that. I bet. Well, fun to reflect on those stories. I've wanted to do that for two months now. We'll still talk about the Gable golf outing and do a little bit of a recap, but I want to mention our guest, Magnum TA Terry Allen, who was in professional wrestling, but got his start in high school and college wrestling, was a state champion in Virginia, went on to wrestle at Old Dominion for a couple years, and had a tragic accident that uh, we're going to get a chance to, to talk about. And it cut his professional wrestling career, and he was on the, the rise to be one of the best in the profession and didn't get a chance to do that. But he's getting our Luthez World Heavyweight Championship Award coming up during the George Stragos Luthez Professional Wrestling Hall of Fame weekend. July 20 and 22, and local flavor are George Tragos Award given to a mixed martial artist who took the skills of wrestling, adapted them in mixed martial arts, going to Mike Van Arsdale from Waterloo, won the NCAA tournament in 1988, and of course a Waterloo West High School State Champion. Is, is his, his MMA career is behind him now, correct? correct? Yep. Still trains yep. individuals in, in mixed martial arts out in Tucson, Arizona, but what a... What a great asset to our community, and it's going to be great to have him coming back because before Kyvin won it, he was our most recent NCAA wrestling Absolutely. champion. Absolutely, And I just have always appreciated his perspective and, and what he has to say, so it's going to be a lot of fun to hear he from He was Mike. smooth. I, I always enjoyed watching him wrestle. Oh, he was, he was fantastic. Great, great just had a great sport. flow. Yeah, great flow and fun to watch. I think that's, that's what you want, can hit big throws. Has different technique in his arsenal. Is it Daryl Whelan that he would have wrestled against? No, no. no. <laughs> Daryl was 1994 graduate. Mike Van Arsdale graduated college in 1988. 88. Yep. I wonder who it was I used to see him wrestle. Wouldn't have been Cedar Falls even probably because I wasn't. You weren't up there. Yeah. yeah I, I'm I'm not sure. I'd have to, to go back. But I think he and Bill Tate wrestled in the state tournament finals one year. And we'll have to ask him about that particular match because there's two guys that went to Iowa State wrestling head to head in in Waterloo in the state tournament finals. So we'll talk to Mike Van Arsdale in our final segment. And just again, I think people are going to have so much fun with the George Trago Sleuthes Professional Wrestling Hall of Fame weekend because there's the professional side, but you also have such a great amateur tie. We mentioned Shelton Benjamin's going to be here. He was a two time All American at Minnesota. Chad Gable, a.k.a. Chaz Betts, was a 2012 Olympian in Greco-Roman. Jason Jordan of the tag team that they're in in professional wrestling. Nathan Everhart was his name in college, wrestled at Indiana. So it just goes on and on and on about who's going to be here, and we just encourage people to come out to that because it's a great weekend, a great time with a lot of great people in our profession who have a great amateur wrestling background. And two of the people getting awards during this Hall of Fame weekend are going to be on the show today, Magnum TA, Terry Allen, and Mike Van Arsdale. So really excited to talk to both those guys. Let's just make sure we recap what happened at the Dan Gable Celebrity Golf Tournament. At the end of last show, we had just a few minutes to just highlight a few things about Stephen Neal and your time with him and who was out there. But I just think there's so much to be said about Dan Gable's ongoing legacy. And I think at the Glen Brand Wrestling Hall of Fame of Iowa inductions, Jim Gibbons, who was the representative or spoke on behalf of the 1987 NCAA championship team for Iowa State, the last Cyclone wrestling team that won an NCAA championship, just had some great commentary about that team. And the thing that came across to me is he said, we're still relevant because Dan Gable's still relevant. And that was 30 years ago. And I think that's a very telling <laughs> statement that when you can beat the man and he's still relevant, he, they stopped the streak of 10 in a row that year. I just think that really feeds into a lot about who Jim Gibbons that was is. was the I slimmest thought. of margins too, wasn't it? No, it was 25 points. 25? They, they blew okay. him out that year. Yeah, it was a one, yeah, 108 was Iowa score. So add 25 points to that, what, 133. 133. Yeah. So it was a... Big win. They had four NCAA champions for Iowa State that year. But what what a great team. What a remarkable team in, in hindsight that they were able to stop the streak. And it all came together. You had Kevin Jackson, LSU, unfortunately drops the program. He transfers into Iowa State. 
places second to Royce Algier, and then goes on to three world and Olympic wrestling championships. Stuart Carter from Waterloo wins it that year. So they just had a lot of great chemistry that year going into the NCAA tournament, and we're still talking about it. I think that it's really a a neat tribute that a team like that can stand the test of time even 30 years later. And I don't know if you remember that team much, if you remember them doing that or the circumstances behind it. I certainly don't. That was I would have been nine years old, but have certainly learned about that in the in the time since then and how important that is. What year was it? 1987. 87. Yeah. 30 years ago, you'd have been how old? How many years ago? Well, it was 30 years ago. So well, subtract I'd been 30 age. years old. Okay. So you're 60. So 30, I'm 67. Yeah. So you should 37 years old. Okay. I lost something there somewhere. <laughs> well, I'm just trying to figure out where, how old you would have been. In 87. In 87. Okay. You'd have yeah. been 37. I'd have been 37. Yep. So what a what a great, <laughs> remarkable team that was. And having the Paulsons back, Trent and Travis, I think that was outstanding to have them here. And Chad Zapital, three-time finalist, his family support system was unreal. They brought in, I'm going to say, 90 people to the banquet. They had a social afterwards. They just absolutely booked the Ramada Inn in Waterloo. I love that enthusiasm. And that just shows you the kind of support that he had locally, had two foursomes at the golf tournament. And it just shows you <laughs> that you can have a residual effect and a residual impact and how important that is for a lot of these people going into that Hall of Fame, Doug. Yeah, that, that, that's a uh, you know, magnificent picture of family, too. Family being so important in wrestling. Yeah, really is. And Jim Brown, who has done a great job of the Wrestling for Life. Talk about impact. Yes. He got the Russ Smith Community Impact Award. There's a guy that has absolutely made a difference in our sport, a tangible difference in sending 7,500 kids to wrestling meets through the, his his program. <laughs> when he left that night out there from uh... – from uh, the, the party we had on Thursday, I called him Jim Brown. Is that right? That's his name. Yeah. What did you think it was? I don't know. I I th- I must not have called him Jim. What? I don't know. I used some other name, and it's like, God, how could I do that? You know? <laughs> yeah. He was very. He reminded me that we were at that breakfast down in Cedar Rapids for uh, the uh, coach down there. The long time. Baron Bremner? Yep. Yeah. And that's where he first remembered me from. Oh, okay. And it's like, wow. There's a guy that's got it going. He knows his stuff. He does. Doesn't forget a face. I I can't even remember a name half the time. So (laughs) It's been a lot of fun reminiscing about the golf tournament. We're going to go full bore into the Trago Stez Hall of Fame weekend. We're going to start that off with one of our inductees, Terry Allen. A.K. Magnum T.A. is next on the mat. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. When all you want is sports, all you need is 1650 The Fan. We are back on the mat. 1650 The Fan. I am Kyle Klingman of the National Wrestling Hall of Fame Dan Gable Museum. Along with Doug Van Gelder, it was a lot of fun reminiscing about the Dan Gable Celebrity Golf Tournament, but as we look forward, we have the George Tragos Luthez Professional Wrestling Hall of Fame weekend coming up. We have one of our award winners, very excited about this guy. He's getting the Luthez World Heavyweight Championship Award from our National Wrestling Hall of Fame Dan Gable Museum. His name is Magnum T.A. Terry Allen is with us. How are you, Terry? Oh, I'm doing great. It's just such a pleasure to be here. Well, hey, you are pretty inspirational, very, actually really inspirational, and which leads into why you're getting this award. You've overcome a lot of obstacles, and that's fed into a lot of people being influenced by your story. But as we just look at this award specifically, what does it mean to you to get this award? Well, it's, it's incredible on so many levels. First of all, Lou Fez is somebody that I always have had the utmost of respect for. Uh, I grew up in Chesapeake, Virginia, Virginia Beach, Virginia, the Tidewater area. And, of course, that's where Lou, uh, you know, lived for, for many, many years. And I, I had the uh, opportunity not to work in the ring. Of course, with Lou, Lou was retired from his in-ring wrestling by the time I was getting started back in, in early 1980s. But 
he did refer, referee a few of my early matches that I had uh, while uh, working for Joe Blanchard, uh, coincidentally enough. So I, I got to share some time around him. Such a special guy, such a class act, and uh, you know, just a great person to be around. So that's number one. And, and then number two, just to have my name associated with Dan Gables in any way, shape, or form in the history of, uh, of wrestling to me is like one of the greatest honors I, I could ever get because uh, Dan was so inspirational for me as a, a young athlete and, uh, and changed the shape of everything that was to come for me in my future because, uh, frankly, had there been no Dan Gable, uh, none of this probably would have happened. Elaborate on that, because you were a high school wrestler. Was that what you gravitated toward first, or was there that professional wrestling bug you had early on? No, it, it was the you know the eighth grader kid in you know getting ready to go into high school, getting introduced to wrestling, for which I had no natural aptitude for whatsoever. I wasn't, uh, I hadn't played other sports, hadn't done other things, but the the challenge of the the human chess game of what wrestling. Uh, you know, is, and then you know, reading Dan's story and the inspiration that that was for me, for some reason, it looked for me and uh, motivated me to just want to transform myself into a champion wrestler. And uh, it, it, it is something that uh, drove me through my, all my high school years and, and uh, you know, took me through uh, going to, where I was going to a college preparatory type high school that was very difficult and to maintain the grades you had to maintain to take part in athletics. It, it, it just all worked together in a, in a really good combination that was a you know, big key to success for me. Did you pick up wrestling right away? Was it a, an easy fit or did it come difficultly? Well, the, the, the skill sets were, were something that I, that I was at some level of comfort with, but physically I wasn't the specimen. And in the ninth grade, which was my first year of actually competing, uh, I, I was one of those uh, younger guys from my grade. And I started out wrestling at 132 pounds and I lost every match my, my freshman year with the exception of the last match, which I, which I won uh, by just a couple of points, but it was just a great, uh, moral victory for me, and uh, it it just it, it's something that progressively got better and better, and it was like a building block type thing. As I as I got physically stronger, physically more mature, uh, you know, and kept improving on the building blocks and things that I was, uh, you know, trying to uh, perfect. Uh, you know, I just kept getting better incrementally uh, through that whole four year period. I didn't, I didn't start out championship material, but uh, I was a kid that couldn't do one push-up in my phys ed class in the eighth grade who went on to pin everybody I wrestled in the state tournament my senior year at 167 pounds and could do 100 push-ups. So yeah. <laughs> it, was, uh, it, it was a pretty crazy story. We are on the mat with Terry Allen, Magnum TA. He's getting the Luthez World Heavyweight Wrestling Champion Award from the National Wrestling Hall of Fame Dan Gable Museum. That will be during the George Tragos Luthez Professional Wrestling Hall of Fame weekend. That is July 20 through 22. Jason Bryant, who does Mat Talk Online, huge Old Dominion fan, so he had a slew of questions that he wanted to ask you. But just starting with your time at Old Dominion and do you remember that professional wrestling was an option when you were in high school and college? Was that something that your teammates would have gravitated toward or knew, known about during the, your time in college? We, we definitely were aware of it, but at the time, I mean, it was just, again, my head was so wrapped around being you know, the best amateur that I could be and, and, and I appreciated the athleticism of what I saw guys do in professional wrestling when guys like Ricky Steamboat and Jimmy Snuka and, uh, and just the uh, ferociousness of guys like Wahoo McDaniels and, uh, and Johnny Valentine that I grew up watching here in the Mid-Atlantic. So I knew about the physicality of it. I knew I didn't know how the business worked, but I knew that those guys were athletes. 
And I, I, I had no uh, vision in my head that it was an athletic competition that, that was like what I did in amateur wrestling. But I knew there, there was something about this performance that they were doing that was crazy, crazy physically demanding and uh, something that I could uh, have imagined doing. What happened for me was my freshman year of college, uh, I continued to wrestle at 167 pounds, which is where I graduated. But I had, again, when I graduated high school, I was 17. And I just turned 18, you know, a couple of weeks after I graduated. So maturity-wise, my body was starting to change from 18 to 19 to 20. And after my freshman year of college, and I basically had dieted my whole life to make weight. I, I started working out with a bunch of muscle heads in Virginia Beach, and I, I quickly went from 100, 167 pounds to about 205 pounds over like a period of a summer. And when I came back to Old Dominion my, uh, my, for my sophomore year, I was like, you know, what am I going to do? Because I wasn't to compete with heavyweights back then because heavyweights guys were generally, I don't even think they had a limit on it at that time. And so, you know, 250 to 275 was about where you, you know, wanted to be as a heavyweight during that, you know, that period of time. And uh, but now that I saw myself, you know, changing and, and uh, this metamorphosis going on with my body, I didn't want to go back to 167 either. So it, uh, it, it kind of, blew my my uh, opportunity uh with pursuing the the you know the collegiate stuff and while i was uh while i was working in virginia beach part-time like i did going through school working security as a bouncer and some of the nightclubs i started seeing some of the professional wrestlers after they would wrestle in norfolk scope come down the clubs and you know i'd talk with them and chat with them and and I started checking into things and seeing the kind of money you had the potential to make and all that kind of stuff. And kind of the light switch went off that, you know, if I could get put some more size on, uh, you know, I might stand a pretty fair chance at, at doing something in that industry. So I was looking at it as a career then uh, at that point. I was a political science major in college uh, with ambition of going on to law school. And I end up... Uh, uh, leaving Old Dominion after uh, the first semester of my sophomore year and going full-time into my commitment of, of, of building my body up uh, with, the, with the goal of, of breaking into professional wrestling. We are on the mat with Magnum T.A. Terry Allen. Let's make sure we do a fact or fiction on that name. I've heard that you got the name Magnum T.A. because of the, the famous character by Tom Selleck, Magnum P.I. Is that true? Well, I got the name for, for that reason, but I got that name from Andre the Giant. He's okay. the one that saw the similarities, facial structure, and the whole thing. I mean, he came up with it at, I mean, all on his own. Uh, said, hey, you kind of look like that Tom Selleck guy. Had the shorter hair back then and a little mustache and, and uh, wore the Hawaiian shirts because I was down in Florida hanging out with the with, with the beach scene and uh, and and it, and it clicked. It sat, you know, it had a ring to it. I didn't know what that character was really going to be when he came up with it because I was wrestling middle of the card uh, Florida Championship wrestling uh, circuit at that time and 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 learning a whole lot about the wrestling business from Eddie Graham and uh, a host of people that I was getting getting the opportunity to spend a lot of time in the ring with. But uh, the the name itself was Andre's idea, and, it, and yes, it did come from the Magnum P.I. Uh, TV series that was famous uh, back in that day. All right, so how much does it get brought up, your I Quit match with Tully Blanchard? Oh, only, you know, nine out of ten times I ever ever have a conversation about my career. <laughs> <laughs> I thought so. And what, what do people want to know? Do they want to just know how gory it was or how tough it was? What do they want to know about it? it, it you know, it, we depicted a conflict that drew everybody in. And, and, and it's funny because 
I look at the four, you know, three, four month battles we went through that were the prologue to everything we did prior to the I Quit match, because the I Quit match was the blow off match, was the final match. And, and think, you know, in my mind, I always think, well, it wouldn't have been so if it, if you didn't know this whole story and this monumental feud, but the, but that singular match standalone by, on its own is done, uh, over through the test of time is mind boggling to me because it's, um, uh, it, it, it was very intense and, and my performance in the ring was, was something that was always, uh, an extension of my own persona and my own character anyway. I mean, it's like if you could be everything that you imagined and it wasn't, you know, a stretch for you to do this character, but you all of a sudden had almost superhuman powers, which, you know, we were able to portray in the wrestling world, uh, that would define who you were. And I, I was so intense in, in my amateur wrestling, it was only natural for me to carry that same kind of intensity and that persona in the pro wrestling and Tully was the same way from his football days and his competitiveness. So when the two of us came together in that steel cage, there was an electricity that, that was undeniable and it, it has, you know, it has lasted a 30 year time span that people that weren't even alive back during that time have yeah. watched it and, and, you know, felt the intensity and realized that there was something special happened there. It was, and of course at the time we were doing it, uh, I, I wouldn't have any more thought that it would have gone down in history like it did than a man to moon. We are on the mat with Magnum TA. He is getting the Luthez World Heavyweight Championship Award from the National Wrestling Hall of Fame Dan Gable Museum. If you could just talk briefly about overcoming the car accident. I know it's the uh, the moment in your life that probably changed it the most, but you overcame that, have inspired millions through your story. What happened there? Well, I mean, the accident itself, you know, was just such a freak thing. I mean, five minutes from your house and, 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 uh, you know, hydroplaning on a wet road and, and having a, you know, near fatal and certainly career ending, uh, you know, accident was, was just mind boggling. But if, if it could, if it was going to happen to anybody and you survive it and overcome and, and go on with life, I had certainly been given the tools to know what I needed to do. Nothing had ever come natural to me or easy to me, and I had had to build all these work ethics from reading the things that, that Dan Gable inspired me from his book and, and how hard he worked to achieve it and, 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 over, uh, and overcome things, overcome challenges. Same principles. I utilized day in, day out for five months while I was in the hot, trying to get back on my feet and get, get things that didn't want to move to move again. And, 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 and somehow through that process, find a mental satisfaction, something that would have been a, uh, just a, 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 not really a task before but being able to just move a finger that you couldn't move before realizing that that was a comp- accomplishment. So I had to really change a lot of perspectives in my mind, but the, my wrestling background and my, all those formative years had given me a systematic approach to being able to, to go through some really hellacious things. And, uh, those principles, you know, had just, stayed by me all this time. I mean, it's by the God that I was able to overcome. Don't get me wrong. Uh, it wasn't because, just because of my mental toughness and all these things. It's a true miracle. When they come out of me into one shot of ever walking again, I truly understand today why they said that. Because, you know, 99% don't ever get any better than what they were when this first started. And even today, 30-some years after the fact, you know, they, they, they've come leaps and bounds about what they can do initially right after an injury to try to, uh, try to, to, uh, lessen the, the, the long-term damage to the cord, but they still don't know how to repair a spinal cord. And when that signal gets turned off, uh, 
you know, it, it's it's there, there's nothing you can do to make it get better. It's either going to start trickling through or it's not, and then you're going to have to do the work to get the most benefit out of what you have to work with. So, you know, I was blessed enough to be able to get back where you to be able to gain independence, to be able to find ways to do things uh, with one good hand and arm, which didn't happen to be my hand and arm of choice because I was right-handed and my left hand is the one that, you know, works. And, uh, you know, it just, everything became uh, a different kind of challenge. And, uh, but again, my, you know, the old stickers we used to have, Matt Burns build characters and, and, and all these little cliche things are, are so true about life in general. But when you have just this overwhelming setback, and not only a setback, but something that, that means you're never going to be able to do certain things the way you used to uh, and get the same kind of satisfaction out of them as you once did. Yep. So a lot of mental, a lot of mental adjustments and, and a lot of the, uh, you know, uh, relying on that strong will and that never give up, never quit mentality. Terry, is, uh, we are out of time. Good. We've enjoyed this interview a lot. Make sure you go to Waterloo, Iowa this year. All right. Cause I think I, you, I, I, yeah, yeah. I, I you got sidetracked last year. Wisconsin. Yeah. I'm going to Wisconsin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, there. So, <laughs> Hey, congratulations. We can't wait to have you here in two and a half weeks. Thanks for taking the time and sharing your story. Well, I'm looking forward to it, guys. Thank you for having me. All right. That was Terry Allen. Up next, we have George Tragos Award winner Mike Van Arsdale next on the mat. Log on and listen online at 1650thefan.com, the online home of 1650 The Fan. We are back on the mat. I am Kyle Klingman of the National Wrestling Hall of Fame Dan Gable Museum, along with Doug Van Gelder. Our final guest is a Waterloo boy. You could even see it on his shorts, his fighter shorts in MMA. He had it across his shorts. We have him at the Gable Museum. It says, Waterloo boy, Mike Van Arsdale will receive the George Tragos Award, which is given to an exceptionally competitive wrestler who adapted his skills and competitive nature to excel in mixed martial arts. He certainly did that. Three-time All-American, NCAA champion for Iowa State in 1988, World Cup champion in 97, translated that into an 8-5 and five MMA record from 98 to 2006. He's coming back for the George Trago Sluthez Professional Wrestling Hall of Fame weekend, July 20 through 22. Welcome back, Mike. How are you? Doing pretty good. I appreciate you guys having me on. Uh, just here in Arizona, it's hot down here, but uh, um, looking forward to getting back to Waterloo for a little bit. You know, the old stomping grounds. I uh, love to bring my kids up there and uh, just spend some time at the old house there and... Uh, I'm excited about the uh, the event. All right, we got to settle this mm-hmm. now. In 1983, Bill Tate, Mike Van Arsdale wrestle in the state championship <laughs> final. Why didn't you guys go a different weight class? I have no idea, to be honest with you. I wasn't really thinking like that. I uh, I just jumped on the scale, saw what I weighed, and thought that I'd go 155. Um, which was, I probably weighed about 165. I think, oh, I'll just go 155 because it was a cut way back then. And uh, it felt pretty good, but I think it would have felt a lot better getting first place. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I got second place there, so I got to give him credit for being a tough wrestler. And he's one of the best wrestlers in the United States, and nobody really knew that. But looking back, I know that was a fact now. No. The guy was really good. Did, did yeah. you, were you guys friends during that time? Of course, he's Columbus. You're Waterloo West. You guys grew up in the same era, same mm-hmm. clubs. Did you guys have a good relationship when you guys were competing against each other? You know what? Um, we didn't really talk that much at first. You know, when I first joined the club down there, but uh, I, he was really uh, respectful and everything to me and, and I to him. And uh, we really didn't wrestle like when middle school or anything like that. We we're always at different weight classes, but I always respected his wrestling. He's one of the guys I used to watch all the time. There try to emulate because he's so fast and strong and great technician. So, um, uh, but, uh, you know, we, we didn't hang out or any, I mean, go over his house that, you know, I went over to his house and stuff, you know, but it it wasn't like we hung out that much, but we were always, uh, I would say good, uh, teammates and everything like that. And then when we had the Russell, of course, it turned into a, um, a rivalry because it was the junior year when that all started. And, uh, Honestly, he was very, very hard to to wrestle for me. Even you know, even into college when we were 
uh, teammates at Iowa State. He's my hardest training partner to go with. So. And you guys grew up in that Boys and Girls Club, and then that translated for you into the, the Wahawk Wrestling Club with Marty Dickey, and you had a lot of guys. Bill Tate Sr., I'm assuming, was part of your influence. T- take us through what it's like growing up in Waterloo and that wrestling community that we want to get back to. What was it like for you to be a, in a championship culture, and then it translates into an NCAA championship? You know what? It was exciting. I would have to say that was the word. Um, you know, as a young kid, uh, uh, growing up, and I used to love going to sporting events, you know, whether it be football, basketball, wrestling, whatever, I was there. But I just, there's something about the wrestling, that individual, you know, uh, out there on the mat, uh, you know, in, in a sport that was just challenging. I mean, way more challenging than any other sport. So I, I pretty much, uh, that with my, you know, my uncles there wrestling for Columbus and stuff, and, you know, I kind of watched them, and then the guys at East that I knew, my sister was a cheerleader there. And then watching West Waterloo, when I knew I was going to go to that school, I started watching, you know, Ken Cade and Desart and all these guys wrestle. And, you know, we just, you know, in the community and in the school, that St. Mary's is all we talked about was wrestling, you know, and, and who was doing this and that in high school. And it just going into the boys club there and then traveling around, the, you know, the Midwest and um, seeing guys win titles. And, and then I started winning. Uh, then just on the way home from those trips, sitting on the back of that, camper talking about the high school kids just got me excited about moving on to the next level you know so it it was it was real exciting then you know and then honestly every school there was had their we didn't know school won a state title they were so spread out but there was great wrestlers at central west east columbus and then in the surrounding area and and all that did was just you know uh push us uh to the top of high school and then in you know into college i was almost shocked that i was going to wrestle in college when it happened I just never really thought about it too much. And then um, once I went to junior nationals, that was it. I was like, okay, I'm going to wrestle in college. And, and then I went, the first thing I said was I'm going to try to win national title. Took a long time to win, but I, I got it. We are on the mat with you know, Mike so. Van Arsdale. He mm-hmm. is a graduate of Waterloo West High School state champion there. And, of course, you went on to win an NCAA championship for Iowa State in 1988. You were the last one before Kyvin Gadsden won in 2015. Was that fun for you to see Kaivin step up and win like that? Of course. I mean, the fact that I got to work with Willie, his father, who was one of the guys I totally looked up to the whole time. You know, and he was real supportive of me when I was wrestling at Iowa State. I I remember going to tournaments and thinking no one really was watching or really cared too much, you know. But uh, I just remember um, uh, Carl Adams and Willie Gatz and always and Phil Parker always sitting there. They'd always call me over to the stands. Now, Van? You know we're watching this now. You're gonna to have to show us, uh, you know, put this guy on his back. Uh, try that. Try, can can you hit that one throw for us? And I said, yeah, I'll do it. You know, and go out there and wrestle. But I just remember that. And the fact that I got to work with uh, Willie, and then we went up to East High. Well, East wasn't having a great time before that in wrestling, and we were able to, you know, get get all those kids, you know, able to help those kids uh, a place in the state like that, and tie and you know, went the two state championships, and you know, the FILA national title, and then the the ride to Iowa State, and then he, he took it even further and won. That that was a thrill to me, just to see him go out there and do that. And, uh, you know, uh, honestly, I think the kid was good enough to win the Olympics too. But I think he just maybe just didn't have the drive to continue with that thing after he walked up the mat. I think he needed a – he thought he needed a, a little break or something. But he was operating at the highest level. As you can see, Schneider actually won the Olympics and won the Worlds, and he was right there with him. On the mat with Mike Van Arsdale, you went into mixed martial arts, and that was in the primitive time you got into MMA. Why did you think that was going to be a good fit for you? You know what? I didn't really know what it was going to be. I just knew that I had put so much work into wrestling, and I didn't win the Olympic gold medal. So I decided to go back to fighting again, which I didn't take. I, I, You know what? It was like this. It was like you would be in the wrestling room at Arizona State, and You'd walk in and they say, "Hey, I got a phone call today. I'm fighting in the UFC on Saturday." Oh, yeah, we'll 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 buy that and watch that. It was just like that. Mm-hmm. You know, the guys, you know, we didn't know we were fight. They would always call us late in hopes that their their guy could be one of us. And I'm talking about Kevin Jackson, Kenny Mundy, Mark Kerr, myself, all the guys that were training down here. And uh, it was just kind of like, "Yeah, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll go fight." You know, it was kind of like that. So when I got, I was in the military afterwards, and. Um, I got a phone call and then, you know, they asked me that I want to fight and I was like, yeah, I'll do it. You know, and, uh, I started going to Las Vegas and doing fights and down in Mexico and I got back into the UFC. And at that point they expected me to, um, to train pretty much full time. 
we well, trained pretty, pretty much full time for it, which I, it was just tough to do because I then had the wife and the kids, and I was officer in the army, and I was trying to train for it, and uh, it was a, it was a lot tougher uh, to do that at that point in time, you know. But uh, it still was enjoyable and and challenging, so. I, I like stuff like that, so it, it worked for me. So did you have a natural inclination toward fighting growing up, or is it just something that translated from wrestling? Hmm, that's an interesting question, because where I grew up at, uh, you had to get in some fights every now and then just because people were always trying to pick on you, you know? So um, you didn't really want to, but you were forced into it sometimes. And, you know, back then, kids did not live in the... Um, Kids did not uh, live in the house on the computer. There were there was none of that. You know, we were out there in the streets, and uh, uh, we were out there fending for ourselves. You know, and uh, well, you know when you're out there in the streets and there's you know kids a year or two older than you that start picking on you. Eventually, you have to defend yourself, and that's what I was. Uh, you know, that situation I was in. Did I like to fight? No, I did not like to fight um, uh, when I was a kid. You know, but it, I wasn't like afraid to do it. You know what I mean? I mean, if I had to defend myself, I, I would do it. So, um, yeah. On the mat yeah. with Mike Van Arsdale, he is getting the George Tragos Award from the National Wrestling Hall of Fame Dan Gable Museum. He will be getting that during the George Tragos Luthez Professional Wrestling Hall of Fame inductions, July 20 through 22. And as you look toward mixed martial arts and your wrestling, we always ask the mixed martial arts artists this question. What's tougher, wrestling or MMA? No, there's no doubt about it. Wrestling is tougher than MMA by far. Winning an NCAA tournament, and I, you know what? I did not win the UFC um, uh, belt, but I can tell you right now, I coach champions, and winning the NCAA championship is 10 times harder than winning the UFC uh, championship. People don't understand that, but what happens is you fall in love with the sport that you do, and you give it everything that you have and more. And when you're done, you typically hit your peak, hopefully at the, you know, right at the end of your career, you reach the, you know, the pinnacle of your career towards the end of it. And when you are done, you know, you couldn't go through two or three more years of wrestling, but then you step into another sport and you do that. And a lot of guys have been able to win titles after wrestling, you know, um, uh, but you would never see a guy go into fighting and then go win an Olympic gold medal or go win an NCAA title. It's not going to happen because uh, you need everything and more to win in wrestling because the sport is so difficult, so challenging. Um, it requires so much of you. And when you, you, you've done that sport, you're pretty much spent. But you can go into another sport, which is MMA. You know, and I, I, honestly, I think the guys that actually go to junior, you know, like maybe just go through junior college, and, and they're still 20 years old or whatever, and they got a lot less than them, they stand a better chance to win a UFC title than the guy that goes to a D1 school and wrestles for four years because you get too good at what you do. You get too good at wrestling, and you can go to any sport. You get too good at kickboxing. You're a kickboxing world champion, yeah, but you can't go 30 seconds with a UFC fighter because you got too good at kickboxing and not good enough at the other sport. Same thing for jiu-jitsu. You, you don't see any world champion jiu-jitsu people. There were actually real world champions going to the UFC uh, and when maybe there's one or two, that's about it. You know, you don't see the guys that take it to the top of their sport, you know, um, and, and then go in there, but you do see wrestlers do it. You know, guys that wrestle, they, you know, they, you know, like Couture and some, some of these guys, you know, they can go in there and do it. But I, I'm telling you, uh, wrestling is way harder than, than, um, fighting. Are you glad you got into wrestling and MMA? You've had some neck injuries and, and really battled some of that. You still glad you chose wrestling? Oh, I wouldn't change anything in my life. I, I like what I did in my life so far. Of course, we all are, you know, we all want the best. And sometimes I, you know, I wish I would have, you know, won a world Olympic gold medal in, in wrestling, in which I did. And I definitely put the work in to do it. It just didn't happen, you know. And, and honestly, somebody was just better than me uh, on the day that it took, you know, the, the trials. You know, during the trials, someone was better than me. You know, and, 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 uh, that's such a marginal thing, you know, for someone to, to actually make that team. They don't have to be much better than you. They just have to be a little bit better than you that day. And, and that's what happened. But I think on any given day, I probably, you know, was good enough to win world Olympic gold medal. You know, um, I just, it just, the timing was a little bit off on that, but I wouldn't change anything. You know, I love football and, uh, I thought I was going to play with anyone in football, you know, but honestly, I think if I would have played football, I wouldn't be myself right now. I'd probably have some serious 
<laughs> some serious problems going on physically because the way I played was to try to run through the guy and, and uh, I was very aggressive and, um, I, you know, I was really excited about it, but, you know, looking back at me, I really hurt myself. Uh, I mean, I hurt myself in wrestling, but I probably hurt myself worse in football. So I, I, I'm glad I chose that sport. We have to close out this segment, but I got to just ask, do you remember when Bob Siddons scolded you at the school assembly? <laughs> yeah, that was embarrassing. Um, <laughs> just because I was a shy kid, it just first, I, you know, I just started getting my, um, you know, my confidence built up. So me and this guy, uh, Jeffrey Walton, who was also a wrestler, he got second in state, the Tim Krieger, you know, so me and Jeff said, hey, let's turn, do a 360 and blow a kiss when they call to the crowd, you know, when they call us up. So I sure did that. I walked out and he didn't do it. You know, I was first. I walked out, I had my hand up and I got to the center of the stage. I did a little Michael Jackson 360, blew the kiss out to the ladies and boom, Start sweating because she was all over me. <laughs> and, uh, it was very embarrassing. Yeah. Very embarrassing. So, uh, uh, you know, I learned a lesson there. You know, you got to you gotta stay humble, you know. And uh, uh, then, you know, we were getting a little too arrogant. So yep. I had to calm it down a little bit there. You know, all right. So. Well, hey, thanks for coming on the show. We can't wait to have you back in Waterloo. Congratulations on this award. Very well deserved. The list of names is very impressive, and you add to that list. We can't mm-hmm. wait to have you back in Waterloo, Iowa, Mike. Thanks, Kyle. I really appreciate it. I'm looking forward to seeing you guys. All right. That was Mike Van Arsdale. He's getting the George Tragos Award. Fun show today with Terry Allen, Magnum TA, and Mike Van Arsdale. And, of course, Doug Van Gelder always adds color. You've been listening to On the Mat on 1650 The Fan. You've been listening to On the Mat, the Cedar Valley's longest-running radio show devoted entirely to wrestling. Brought to you by Roland Ford and the National Wrestling Hall of Fame Dan Gable Museum on 1650 The Fan. This show is part of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. For more wrestling podcasts, head over to matttalkonline.com.